Now we continue with the case where sigma square is going to be unknown. So the only difference that from the previous case is going to be we have our population and it's uh, the, the population mean is mu, mu and it is unknown. That's what we would like to estimate actually, not the point estimate only, but also a, a, a confidence interval estimate. But this time sigma square is going to be unknown. But there is one very important thing here. We are going to now strictly assume that this population is normal. Well, in the previous case, also we take it as normal, but uh, remember we had used two uh, relaxations in assumptions. And the first one was if the sample size is large enough, then we could use what we have done for any distribution. Now for this case, we are going to assume that our distribution is strictly normal distributed. So we have a normal distribution with both mu and sigma square unknown. So the only assumption that we make is normal distribution. So that's a very realistic typical case in, uh, in, in sciences or uh, daily researches, I might say. So for this case, again, we take a sample of n elements here and we take x bar as the sample mean, which is going to be the point estimate of population mean. Then here is interesting point. Since we do not know sigma, instead of sigma, we use sample standard deviation. As you can see, this sounds like at first sight, not at first sight, but this exactly sounds like the second relaxation of assumptions that I have uh, covered in the, in the end of the uh, previous lecture. I'll come to the relation with that, so just follow me. So we have our sample, from our sample, we both estimate, we both obtain x bar, and we also obtain standard uh, deviation. Note that this is going to be equal to estimated standard error. In the previous case, where the denominator was population standard deviation of square root of n, we used standard error of x bar. Now we are going to be using estimated standard error of x bar. But now for that change, we have a price to pay. Note that now when we do not know the population standard deviation, but in instead use an unbiased estimate of population um, uh, uh, standard deviation using sample standard deviation, the uncertainty is going to increase. And the, uh, the increase in uncertainty is an increase in variance. To sum it all, now we are not going to have, when we apply this standardization procedure, this is not going to be distributed with normal uh, distribution with zero and mean and one standard deviation because the denominator here is, uh, compared to this one, there is an additional uncertainty. Therefore, this is going to change the shape of the distribution and uh, that div distribution is actually called a t distribution. But there is one more thing here. Note that s here, if you compute, if you, pre if you predict the, the uh, population standard deviation value using, let's say, n samples, and for this one, let's call it s9, which is going to represent s, my, uh, s 10 times uh, 10 minus 1 and compare it with, for instance, with S with, uh, I don't know, 25 um, observations. In this case, it's going to be S25, call it. Note that this is going to be a more reliable estimate of population uh, standard deviation compared to this one. Because since we are using 25 observations here, uh, this is going to, there's going to be more information uh, available, so this is going to be a, the, the, the mean square error, I may say, of this estimator, this estimate is going to be smaller than this one. So what I would like to say is this, depending on A, sample size, and also actually the N minus one is going to be the denominator of S, that's why I have written here, where N minus one is going to be N minus one square root of one, my I of one to N, X minus X bar square, that is the formulation that we have here for s square, and s is the square root of that one. Anyway, so that n or n minus one value will determine the uncertainty. So therefore, since actually this t distribution is related with uncertainty, each 
n minus 1 value or n value will correspond to a different t distribution. That wasn't the case for normal distribution because we hadn't we didn't have that issue. The mu was unknown, x bar was obtained from the sample, and we just divided by uh, population standard deviation over square root of, and this was exactly known. Since this is not known for this case, and since the, the, the precision of s will change depending on the sample size. Therefore, depending on the sample size, we are going to have different t distributions. Therefore, this random variable, the one computer variable, is going to be t distributed with n minus one, what we call degrees of freedom. That is a new term that we are going to be using from now on, degrees of freedom with this abbreviation. Well, think about, let's say we have two observations. And in this case, s square is going to be equal to 1 over n minus 1, i from 1 to n, x i minus x bar square. So therefore, it's going to be equal to 1 over 1. Let's just concentrate, well, that, that, let that 1 over 1 stay here. But the reason why we divide with n minus 1, which is the degrees of freedom for s square, I'll, I'll, I'll try to make this easy to understand. Now, it's going to be equal to x1 minus, let's put it into a larger parenthesis, mean, which is x1 plus x2 over 2 square plus x2 minus x1 plus x2 over 2 square. Now, let's concentrate on this part. The first term is going to be, let's concentrate just inside this parenthesis, it's going to be equal to x1 minus x1 over 2, so it's going to be x1 over 2 minus x2 over 2. Square. And the second term is going to be just the other one, x2 over 2 minus x1 over 2 square. Now let's go one step further. This is going to be simply equal to x1 minus x2 over 2 square. So there's also a square here. Plus, this one can also be written as minus x1 minus x2 over 2 square. Let's go one step further and finish this derivation. Let's call this x1 minus x2 d. Call it anything that you like. This is going to be equal to the, the distance or range, let's call it, range between two variables, two observations, I'm sorry. It's going to be simply equal to range square over four, plus we have also square here, we have also here r. So this is going to be range square over four. And this is going to be equal to two range square over four. These details are not that important. Range square over two. Here is the deal. Important point. S square is actually dependent only on range, Ra where range is the distance between two observations, deviations from, from two observations. What do I mean by that? Actually, here to determine S square, we don't have two degrees of freedom. Of course, here there is also one over one, but it doesn't matter. So, since this is actually, um, uh, since S also see actually, although it looks like it is a function of x1 and x2, actually it is called g1. It is a function of range x1 minus x2 in absolute values. This is what s square is a function of when we are talking about a single variable. That's why actually s square is not a um, uh, is not uh, does not depend on two variables, but actually it depends on one variable, which is the distance or difference between two, two uh, sample, two observation values. So the degrees of freedom of S square is not equal to two, but it is equal to one. So therefore, actually, if you um, uh, increase the uh, N size, if you make it three, four, you are going to see that using the same logic, actually degrees of freedom of s square is going to be equal to n minus one. And you may ask the question, why is not equal to n minus one? What about the degrees of freedom for x bar? Actually, it is, believe me, it is exactly equal to n degrees of freedom because x bar is going to be a function of x one to xn. 
there is nothing that n minus one trick here going on when it comes to x bar. And what's the big deal about s square? It is because we lose one of the degrees of freedom when we compute x bar sample mean value. X bar is already a function of all xi values. So when you have a function of each, um, each observation subtracted from the sample mean and then the square or whatever, but that operation itself, when we do it for all observations, makes, makes S square lose one of the degrees of freedom. So that's why S square, it, the, the, that's one of the reasons, not maybe a very uh, mathematical reason, but I think an intuitive reason uh, to explain why in the denominator we have N minus one. And we are going to have an unbiased uh, estimator for variance in this case. And this is the same thing for t distribution since we are using s here and since it has uh, n minus one degrees of freedom, therefore the corresponding t distribution is going to have n minus one degrees of freedom. So in graphical terms, what we have is something like that. If our normal distribution is this blue one, depending on degrees of freedom, and we can start with the smallest degree of freedom cases, t is equal to one, right? And for this case, n is going to be equal to two. You may say, what about n is equal to one? When we have a single um, observation, the sample standard deviation is going to be equal to zero because we have a single observation. Therefore, we are not going to be able to compute this, right? This can't go to infinity. So the smallest uh, sample size on which uh, we can talk about the T distribution is n is equal to two. And for this case, the degrees of freedom is going to be k is equal to one k is equal to one is going to be the most broadest distribution here. Note that still the, the, the expected value will be around zero, just like standard normal distribution. It's going to be a symmetric distribution, but it's going to be much broader. So there's going to be what we call heavier tails on both sides. As we increase the degrees of freedom to k is equal to two to, for instance, 10. So k is equal to 10 means we have a sample of 11 observations. We are going to be obtaining a more reliable estimate of S square. Therefore, the uncertainty is going to be lower. Therefore, this is going to be, again, not maybe as, 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 as narrow as normal distribution, but not as broad as the, the, the T distribution with one degree of freedom. We are going to be somewhere in the middle. So as the degrees of freedom go to infinity, we obtain normal distribution. So in mathematical terms, you can actually prove that mathematically, but note that I haven't shown the, the, the representation of t-distribution, which I will not, it is not within the scope of this course, uh, but as n goes to infinity, t-distribution will converge to standard normal distribution. That is the idea. But actually, that's a theoretical result. For practical purposes, we are going to see that, and actually we, uh, we gave a hint in, uh, about that in the relaxation of the assumptions part, which was the last thing I talked about in the previous uh, presentation. Uh, for a smaller number of n elements, such as 40, we can easily assume that both have converged, but I'll come to that. So when we have t distribution, how are we going to read the values of t distribution? Note that T distribution is not going to be a unique distribution, but it's going to depend on the number, on the degrees of freedom. So the representation form of T distribution is going to be like this. T alpha over two or alpha, depending on whether we are talking about a single-sided or two-sided confidence intervals, is going to represent the significance level. Comma, we are also going to show the degrees of freedom here with n minus one degrees of freedom. So T alpha specific alpha value at 10 will not be equal to T alpha at 20. For each degrees of freedom, we are going to have a different alpha value. And here, let's remember what alpha significance level means. Significance level means it's the point here that T alpha over T n minus one, find the point on the horizontal axis such that the right hand side here, tail from this point to plus infinity here, is going to have an area, the, the, the area be beneath this, uh, be, uh, below this curve is equal to alpha over two. So using the very same logic we have done uh, for two-sided intervals for normal distributions, 
This time, t distributed random variable for two-sided intervals should lie between minus t alpha over 2 and minus 1 and plus t alpha over 2 and minus n values with a probability equal to 1 minus alpha, which is actually confidence level. So in our textbook, how are we going to read the t values? Well, there is a table, of course, related with t values in your appendix. Depending on the, the, uh, the, the version of your textbook, the table number and page number may change, but this is going to be the representation. Now, here is the point. There is a, a, a drastic difference between t distribution. There's a couple of drastic differences between t distribution tables and standard normal distribution tables. First of all, in standard distribution tables, the cumulative distribution values were, were, were given. So it was this area which was given. If this is Z0, the area here is equal to cumulative distribution value of F0 from minus infinity to that value. In T distribution table, the significance level notation is used. So we are going to be using the right hand, the, 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 the corresponding probability that we see here is going to be the right hand side tail. All right. And there is another important point here. Since T distribution is not a unique distribution, what I mean by that, for each degree of freedom, we are going to have a different T distribution. So compared to the normal distribution, standard normal distribution table, it consists of two pages. And in those pages, you have a pretty much high, highly accurate table consisting of two or three significant uh, digits. I cannot remember exactly. These show the X values and the corresponding probabilities were written here. These were the probability values and these were the Z values, that was the first digit or first two digit, and these were the last couple of digits. I cannot remember exactly, but these were the Z values and the corresponding probabilities were written here. Here, this is a little bit different. We have a compact table. The degrees of freedom are given horizontal like this from, now note that this is degrees of freedom. This lowercase mu in Greek letters. So it's going to one, two, three, four, it goes, actually I just cut it so because it, it so it increases down here. And these are not that the right hand side probabilities only. So if you would like to find, for instance, a T 0 0.05, let's say five. Now, what does that mean? It means our sample size is six and we are trying to find the T uh, random variable such that it is right hand tail area is going to be equal to 0 0.05. It actually asks for this value. So what you do here is you go here to this um, uh, row here, the, five, the, the, the for six uh, observations, we have five degrees of freedom and you here search for the alpha value and alpha is 0 0.05. Therefore, the value that you are going to read is going to be equal to 2.015. So note that this, this is also pretty much different from how to read the uh, normal distribution table, but that's very simple. All right, now let's sum it all. I'm not going to show the derivation because it's very simple. It's the same logic there, but when we try to write a two-sided confidence interval using E distribution, <coughs> this is going to be the formulation that we are going to use. Note that this is the very same formulation that we have used for normal distribution, the only difference was instead of t distribute, t random variable values, we use z values, which are the uh, standard normal distributed uh, random variables. These were the values that we have used. Now, instead of those, and of course, we had instead of s, we had population standard deviation values. Now we have these ones, so when you replace sample standard deviation by uh, when you uh, replace a population standard deviation by sample standard deviation, you replace the Z values by the corresponding T values. Don't forget, you also have to include the N minus one values here uh, to, to show uh, the, the uh, correct T distribution. And the probability that mu is going to be between lower and upper limits, again, note that this value is identical here and here. Therefore, we are going to have 
symmetric value. So it's going to be x bar and x bar minus this value x bar plus the very same value. So well, actually these two sides should be equal. And we say that mu is between those two intervals with a certain confidence. Level. Well, when it comes to one-sided confidence bounds, the, the lower confidence bounds is going to be represented by this one. The upper confidence bounds is going to be represented by this one. Again, the same, very same logic. What has changed compared to this one is only alpha over two has turned into alpha because we now uh, sacrifice that uh, uh, alpha probability only on one side, we let the other side go to infinity. Now, let's remember what we have done in relaxations in assumptions. I talked about that, I mentioned that a couple of times during this presentation. Let me show this. I said that if n is greater than 40, then sigma can be replaced by sample standard deviation. That was what I said. And actually, I have shown you this. Now, let's just go large sample confidence interval. Let's combine with what is being said here with what is being said uh, here in this equation. All right. This says that if n is greater than 40, what about this, these things that I'm talking about? This says nothing about n. Actually, if we go back here, we can see that n may start from two to other, uh, it may go to increasing other values. But note that we have seen here as n goes to infinity, t will turn into normal distribution. So if you have a very, very large size, one, 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 one zillion of uh, samples, then you may use s square root of n here, and the resulting thing is going to be normal distribution. You don't need to look up in the t distribution table. If you have some value, it's not all. Uh, the, 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 you may actually wonder where does these values lead to check it, uh, check, uh, please check in your textbook you are going to see that after some value the, 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 after some uh, limiting value the rest of the degrees of freedom are not given because the T distribution will converge to normal distribution alright so this is one difference we are talking about small sample sizes, also small sample sizes here, whereas this one says that n is going to be greater than 40. But the important point here is, this says nothing about x distribution. This is going to be valid even if x is not normal distributed. Why? If you remember the first of these relaxations, it says that if the sample size is greater than 30, due to central limit theorem, we can use normal distributed sampling distribution of x bar. We can assume that x bar is uh, normally distributed. Therefore, n is going to be for, greater than 40. On top of that, for any distribution of x, we, can, we are going to be using this equation. On the other hand, this one is valid only for normal distributed x. What do I mean by that? Let's assume that x is normal. You have a sample size of 20 observations. You are going to use this method. N is equal to 40 or 50. You may either use this or you may either use this. You may say, well, which one am I going to use? Note that when N is equal to 50, T distribution value here, T alpha over two at uh, 49 is going to be very, very close to Z alpha over two value here. Since these two values are going to be very close to each other, any of them would work. So that's, this is the idea. If x is normal, the distribution valid for all uh, sample sizes. However, after a sample size of 40, t and normal distributions cannot be distinguished. This is the idea. On the other hand, if x is not normal distributed, then x bar a minus mu over s square root of n will not be t distributed. Right? This is the important point. Actually, this is for small sample sizes. For large sample sizes, when n is greater than 30, we are going to be using central limit theorem, and we don't need to use, uh, and uh, when n is greater than 40, we don't need to use t distribution, so that's valid. So let's put it that way. n is greater than 40, in this case, both central limit theorem works. 
So X bar, normal distributed. And you can use S instead of S square, instead of variance, uh, uh, sample variance, in, uh, uh, instead of population variance. This is what it says. If X, not normal. Now I would like to <clears throat> solve an um, example question related to T distribution. Now we have, let's assume that we have a factory which produces, I don't know, some component, some components related to steel. And well, this, this factory has been running for a time. And we would like to determine the, the average, the population mean of the strength of these products. Right there, of course, there are going to be some variability in each of these products. And we would like to estimate the population mean values of strength measurements in megapascal. Now, we assume that each of these products in the population in all history uh, is normal distributed. So hence, this should be somehow validated, which I'm going to uh, skip. But just assuming that X is normal distributed, we would like to estimate mu, but not only a point estimate, but since we are, using a we are going to be using a finite number of observations in a sample, uh, we also need an interval estimate for mu. Therefore, what we do is we random sample 22 measurements, which means we take from different days, different hours, 22 of those samples and call them Xi with different values. This is a question from your textbook, so you can take all of these values here. So now this actually exactly fits the scheme that we have talked about previously. A normal distribution, right? We would like to predict, we would like to estimate mu and also an, an, an a point estimate and an interval estimate for mu. We do not know variance of that population. And note that this is a realistic case since we are talking about the factory uh, production line. Since we do not know mu, it's very natural that we wouldn't be knowing sigma square. But we would like to estimate this quantity. So we take a finite sample of measurements. And note that these measurements for those who have done an internship previously in quality control, which is not very possible due to that uh, corona incident that, that, that uh, last summer probably uh, not many of you, if you were able to uh, do a live internship. Anyway, uh, those small number of uh, measurements are usually the typical case. There may be even smaller number of measurements. The reasoning is very simple. Actually, like you cannot take 1,000, 100,000 of these. That would be too much costly, and it would be both time consuming, and it would also cost, these number of measurements would cost too much, and those products will be also uh deteriorated or uh distracted during measurements so we are going we need to um uh, obtain a reliable result with the smallest number of measurements so just uh take these numbers from your textbook what we do is we determine the sample mean and the sample mean here is i just copy from my notes 13.71 megapascal which is determined by xi over n on to n formulation. Then we also need to determine the sample variance, which is 1 over n minus 1, xi1 and xi1, x bar. x bar is going to be this quantity, square here, which I always forget. And the s value is when you find use this formulation and determine the square root, we determine the sample standard deviations is going to be equal to 3.55 megapascal. Now note that these two values are going to be the two information that we are going to be obtaining from this sample. We also know that we have 22 observations, measurements. From these three pieces of information, we have to make an inference about mu. Now I think that's a more fun of way in putting this all together, everything we have done starting from the beginning of the lecture up to this point, because this is a more realistic case. This is usually how uh, quality control is applied. So, and now note that here, when we use this information, we can directly find a point estimate for population mean. But now we do not know how much this population, the precision of our estimation, how much this population mean in, in a, uh, in a, in a uh, 
uh, what may be the range that population uh, mean uh, may be varying, but not that essentially population mean is constant. What is varying is our upper and lower uh, confidence bonds, uh, but you should remember the, the interpretation. So for that, what we do is we have to determine at the very beginning a confidence level and a significance level. Let's do the significance level for 0 0.05, which is the very much industrial practice. I'll talk about more when it comes to hypothesis as why we use this value, why can we use other values, but for the timing, we may use this one. Now, once we do is remember actually what we should do is, in the previous case, if you are talking about two-sided confidence interval, and we are for this specific case, we are actually we are going to be using T alpha over two. So I go, I, I'm going to need T alpha over two and minus one value. So that I'm going to be determining the ups, uh, up and, uh, the, the lower and upper bounds. And here T alpha over two is going to be equal to 0 0.025. And N minus one degrees of freedom here is going to be equal to, which we call K to be equal to 21. Therefore, here this is going to be 21. So let's put these values 0 0.05 with 21. So we search for the T value in the T distribution with 21 degrees of freedom, such that here is going to be T0.21 with a T distribution of 21 degrees of freedom, such that the right hand tail is going to be equal to 0 0.05. For that, we look up in our table, we look up for the case with 21 observations, uh, uh, 21 degrees of freedom, all right, with 0 0.05 right hand side tail, which is going to be equal to, I'm very sorry, this is going to be 0 0.025. I'm very, very sorry. Just realize, all right, because this is uh, the, the half of the probability is going to be here. The half of the significance level is going to be here. So it's going to be 0 0.0025, which is here. So if you cross these, they are going to be here. So the value that we are looking for, 0 0.025 with 21 degrees of freedom, is going to be 2.08. All right. Actually, I can get rid of. Which one? Maybe I can get corrupted. This one, yeah, this is going to be better. It's not going to uh, cover any unnecessary space. Now, the next thing that we are going to do is we are going to be just using this equation. Find x bar value, t value is known, s value is known, square value, root of n is known, so it's very simple. So it's going to be simply, let's see, probability that 13.71 x bar minus t value 2.080 multiplied by standard deviation where is our standard deviation 3.88 now instead of samples uh, population standard deviation now i'm using sample standard deviation divided by square root of 21 smaller equal mu smaller equal 30.71 plus Let's calculate this value. Actually, I am not going to do that. Unfortunately, I haven't calculated in my notes. That's great. So put this value again here, which I'm too lazy to do. This probability is going to be equal to 0.95. That's exactly what is required in this question. But note that I have my own uh, decided on that value. In some questions, this may be directly given. If it's directly given, just use it for this question. I just assume that it's equal to. 0 0.05. Then when you do the calculation, the result is going to be equal to 12.14 or equal mu, which is going to be 15.28 megapascal with a probability of 95. So the result can be presented in this fashion. Mu is going to be between those two upper and lower values uh, at 95% confidence level. So this is going to be our result. So note that we have also this one information given. Uh, there is, where is our mu? Yeah. This is going to be our first result. This is going to be our second result. So these two results actually complete the inference related with population parameter. 
there is nothing else that you are, we are going to say about population parameter coming from this sample. Note that X was normal distributed is the uh, assumption. These are all based on the assumption that X is normal distributed. Now comes the third part related with the confidence interval estimations. This time we are going to uh, determine a confidence interval for sigma square. So this is going to be a pretty much uh, change of route, I may say, because starting from chapter seven, most of our interest was basic, basically uh, based on x bar, sample mean, and the corresponding estimate, which the, the estimator of uh, which x bar estimates, which was population mean. This time we shift our attention to population of variance, which is going to be estimated by sample variance. So this is basically going to be our sample variance estimate is going to be equal to a population variance estimator. That's that much we know, we know that. But just like we have found a confidence interval mu for, for, uh, for reporting the precision of our estimate using X bar, we would like to come up with uh, reporting a precision of uh, sigma square using S, S square value. All right, now we have a new distribution in town which is called chi-square distribution. So chi-square distribution is denoted with this, the chi Greek word. So here is the uh, whole scenario. If we have X to be normal, and X being normal is very much important when it comes to variance estimation, as opposed to or compared to population mean estimation because when it comes to population mean estimation first we first of all we have the very powerful theorem uh, the central limit theorem which says that as sample size increases x bar will tend to normal distribution that's great and for small sample sizes well when we had x to be already normal distributed then we had uh, the the t distribution uh, where we do not know the sigma square value so we had some tools to deal with non-normality, I may say, when it comes to sample mean. And also that although this is out of the uh, scope of the topic of this course, but still if, it's, if it is not severely non-normal, still we may use T distribution to some extent. So T distribution will still be applicable, although X is not uh, normal, but not severely not normal, but from that we obtain an X bar and still it's going to be close to the T distribution. Now, when it comes to chi-square distribution and estimating various, this is not the case. We should have a strictly normal distribution. If this is the case, we define a random variable X square. Note that this is not the X square we have defined previously. That is a certain definition. I mean, what, what I mean is, we had x and we had expected values of x square x the random variable that's not the one this is actually you may this is a slightly different than uh, a symbol use something like this maybe if you like anyway x square is defined in this fashion you obtain s square from your sample sample variance from your sample you multiply by n minus one and you divide by the population variance this is going to be x square you may see the representation pretty much awkward, but actually it's not compared with the previous representation related with Z value related with X bar. We defined it in this fashion. Or we define T value using this representation. In both of these representations, both that we have the sample derived statistic. We subtracted from the unknown for, uh, population mu value and we divide it by the standard deviation of population either known or standard deviation from the sample unknown then it's going to be t distribution but the important thing is in this standardization we both use information from the sample and there is also n and we also use and maybe sometimes s is going to be another additional information from the sample and also we use the unknown population value Actually, here then we say that these are going to be upper between upper and lower limits. 
then we leave mu on one side and do, uh, put all of the rest of the terms on this side and this side when we come up with a confidence interval for mu. So the known uh, sample value, uh, sample statistic here, the unknown is here and that, that whole um, uh, computation is going to give us the value of z or, or, or t, which are normal, standard normal or t distribution. Now that, uh, similar to that computation normalization that we do here for x bar, a similar case is here. We uh, take s square, which is going to be computed from the sample values. n minus one is simply again computed from the number of uh, elements observations in the sample, and we divide it by the unknown population variance. Now, when you know this population variance, this whole thing will be chi-square distributed. So just like T distribution, chi-square distribution will also and degrees of freedom element. So for corresponding to each degrees of freedom, because it is related with S square, and S square will depend on the precision or the, 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 the uh, precision of the accuracy obtained from n samples as n will increase we are going to have a higher uh, higher uh, a more precise uh, estimate of uh, population variance using uh, sample variance so that's why for each of the n values we are going to have a different chi square uh, distribution well note that arithmetically if you write instead of this s square when we write one over n minus one and sum of square of deviations from the sample mean you these will cancel each other and this x square is basically equal to sum of square of deviations from the sample mean divided by population variance but actually this form is pretty much straightforward or simply used maybe you feel like you can use this one but i don't think this gives any additional information anyway First, before expected value and variance talking about this, let me talk about the shape of the distribution of x square. Now, this x square, the, the chi square distribution, first of all, will be a non symmetric distribution. Unlike z normal or t distributions. The reasoning is very simple. Now, we have n minus 1. This is going to be a positive value because n is going to be at least equal to 2. Now, note that both of them are squared elements. So sample variance and population variance are both going to be greater or equal 0. And if we have more than one sample and if we have a non-zero population, uh, a greater than zero population variance, this is going to be the case. Of course, you may have two uh, observations in a sample. Those two observations may be identical. Then S square is going to be equal to zero. So there is a possibility that this value is going to be zero, right? Uh, on the other hand, uh, this is going to be strictly non-negative because both of them are squared. Therefore, the typical chi-square distribution will be something like this. When I say typical chi-square distribution, when I say why do I say typical? Because chi square distribution will depend on n minus one, which is the degrees of freedom. So on the, for different degrees of freedom, for instance, when k is equal to two, this is somewhat like an exponential distribution. Not of course exactly exponential distribution, but somewhat like. So as the number of uh, the degrees of freedom and or the sample size increases, this is going to turn into a, a single model distribution. As you can see, for k is equal to five, it's going to be something like this. A right skewed distribution, and k is equal to 10, is going to start to look like, not still normal, because it's going to be still um, uh, pretty much right skewed, but as the degrees of freedom increases, it's going to start to look like a normal distribution. But for the cases when k is equal to 10 to 20, we are going to be in this range. All right. What about the expected value of a chi-square random variable? Note that expected value of z, normal distributed random variable, zero. Expected value of a t-distributed random variable is zero. Expected of x square will not, of course, be equal to zero because the lowest limit is going to be the left side. The lowest value that you can take is equal to zero. Therefore, it's going to be, I'm not going to show the derivation. And actually, I haven't shown the explicit form of chi-square uh, distribution. It's out of the scope of this course. 
expected value is basically equal to n minus one, which is equal to eight, which is the degrees of three. Now, actually, there is a bonus video I made related for, with this topic. Well, there actually there's going to be a, a comparison of S square, which is sample variance, and also the uh, variance estimator, which I have defined previously using this formulation. The difference is the denominator instead of n, I use an uh, instead of n minus one in S square. Here I use an n here, and I have previously shown in chapter seven in lecture six that this is an unbiased estimator. But here there, I'm going to be comparing the efficiencies of those two for a normal distributed random variable. I'm not going to that much detail, of course, in this video, but what I'm going to talk about here is, we know that previously expected value of S square is without any distributional assumptions is going to be equal to population variance square, uh, po po population variance. Now, can we actually prove that this is the case using chi-square distribution? Note that chi-square distribution will be valid only for a normal distributed x, and, but since this is a more general result, so this distribution should also help by use, should also uh, be held uh, or should hold also for chi-square distribution. So let's see. First, x square, I want to convert this, I'm interested in s square. So note that x square, the chi-square random variable, uh, chi-square random variable is basically equal to this. I have put these terms to that side. So our s square estimator, very, uh, sample variance estimator is equal to this. Now, expected value of, Is going to be equal to expected value of s, s square. Now note that this population variance constant is n minus one constant. You can take them out. It is expected value of x square is equal to expected value of s square. Expected value of x square is as you can see equal to n minus one here. So when you multiply n minus one by n minus one, we find that expected value of sample variance is going to be equal to population variance, which was the general result we have already found. Note that this is valid only for normal, only for normal distributed x. Therefore, this is a much narrower result. This is a more general result, but as I said, this should. Well, note that previously I have not talked about variance of uh, uh, sample variance estimator. I have not talked about this, that, that, that may be a tricky concept, variance of sample variance estimator. Since this is itself a statistic and estimator, hence it's a random variable, it should have a variance. Although we have talked about variance of x bar, which is equal to sigma square over n. This was an easy uh, derivation. Now, for chi-square random variables, we can already find this, directly find this. Actually, I have shown this in more detail in the bonus video, right? So I'm going to skip that, but basically variance of x squared is equal to 2k, two degrees of freedom. So basically, as the degrees of freedom increases, this uh, x squared, chi squared random variable, also expected value increase, and also its variance increase. That's why as you go further in terms of when you increase the degrees of freedom, you are going to both move to the right-hand side. So the location of the distribution or the peak of the distribution will move to the right-hand side. So it's going to go from here to here. And compared to those two, for instance, if this is a degrees of freedom with, let's say, of course, that was a very awful drawing. Let me put it that way. All right. For instance, if this is for k is equal to 20, k is equal to 40, the distribution will be both this peak will move from this point to this point here, and also the distribution, the broadness of the distribution will also increase. So both the expected, of course, this mode is not the expected value, but it should give you an idea about where the expected value is. The expected value is going to be on the right-hand side of this mode. Note that but both the location of the uh, distribution and also spread of the distribution increases with, uh, with increasing the uh, sample size. This is the issue. So how can we read these values and how are we going to use these values 
in computing uh, in computing uh, confidence intervals for population parameter sigma square. Well, the very same derivation we have done before, just like our t distributed random variable or our uh, uh, standardized normal distributed random variable related with sample mean, we have our x square with a certain probability with a lower and upper limit at the probability or confidence level of one minus alpha. Now there is a very important uh, the difference between this representation and compared to the other previous two representations related with standard normal and t-distributed random variables. The lower, let's say these are for x square and this is upper x square. These are not the lower and upper limits we are going to finally found, uh, find at the very end. These are not going to be noted for previous cases. The upper limit was just the negative of the lower limit because the, it was a symmetric distribution. So we had always had for two-sided limits, we always had a minus L or L, L value, which is equal to minus U and U value, which is equal to minus L. That was the general issue. So these were equal to each other. For a chi-square distribution, that's not going to be the case. For chi-square distribution, since we don't have a symmetric distribution, but the idea is still the same, we would like to, if a one minus uh, alpha of confidence level is given, we would like to leave the half of this significance level on the right-hand side and half of this significance level to the uh, left-hand side. Therefore, we are going to find the upper and lower bounds such that the tail here, but note that this tail will not go to minus infinity because the, uh, this, the, the, the x, the random uh, variable of the chi-square random variable, the support of the chi-square random variable does not contain negative values. So from zero to up to this point, we have an alpha over two of probability. And from this point to uh, plus infinity, we are going to have alpha over two probability. And the notation of uh, chi-square random variable, the representation is very similar to t distribution. Just like in t distribution, we showed t alpha over two with a certain degrees of freedom. It's the very same thing here, because for each degree of freedom, we have a different t and we have a different chi-square distribution. And this shows the non-symmetric, not symmetric, uh, non-symmetric property of chi-square distribution. Therefore, these two will not be equal to each other. So, how can we differentiate the left-hand side from the right-hand side? For the right-hand side, we use alpha over two, and for the left-hand side, we do not use minus alpha over two k because that would be totally wrong. That would, be, if this is the point that would put the, uh, the left-hand side limit here, which is meaningless because it cannot be negative value. Therefore, this is going to be, again, this area being alpha over two means that the rest, the right-hand side area is minus one over two, minus alpha over two K. Note that this would correspond to, we are talking about in this representation, this represents the right-hand side probability. Since we are interested in the cumulative probability of alpha over two here, the rest is one minus alpha over two. So the lower limit is this one, the higher limit is this one. But note that these are the limits for x square, not sigma square yet. So how are we going to read the chi-square distribution table? Very, very much like t distribution table, we have the degrees of freedom here which are equal to n minus one, sample size minus one, and these are the associated alpha values. However, unlike the t-distribution case, note that t-distribution, let me quickly go back. Where is t-distribution? Yeah, t-distribution has started from minus 0.40, so this was the value, this area, 0.40, for different degrees of freedom when this area is 0.40, what's going to be the number? So this number is, as you can see, is somewhat like 0.3 to 0.3, 0.2 to 0.3. This value changes with respect to different degrees of freedom. When it comes, comes to chi-square distribution, on the other hand, actually we are going to start from 0.995. However, this actually corresponds to this point here. This area is going to be 0.995. Actually, the left-hand side probability is going to be one minus 
five, which is going to be 0 0.005. Is there another zero here? Okay, you can just calculate. So 0 0.05, for instance, is going to correspond to this point here, such that there is 50% of probability here, 50% probability here. It's going to be actually the median of chi-square distribution. On the other hand, median of uh, T distribution or normal, standard normal distribution is going to be e actually equal to zero. So you can read this table in this fashion. Well, two-sided confidence intervals. Well, this is the very same method that we have followed in normal distribution and T distribution, but there is a, not a trick, but a, a maybe a, a, a tricky part here, I may say. Well, we are going to use, instead of x squared, we write this form. And on the left-hand side, we write the, 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 the lower limit, which the significance level is going to be equal to 1 minus alpha over 2, where 1 minus alpha over 2 is going to be, note that it's going to correspond to this area, right? Since alpha over 2 is the area on the left-hand side. And alpha over 2 is going to be, again, this area. So these are the, this is the low, the, the, the left-hand side limit, this is the right-hand side limit. But here's the tricky part. Since this is in the denominator, when you put, for instance, when you put this term here and this whole term here, we are going to be obtaining sigma square smaller than n minus 1, s square over this chi-square random distributed random variable, n minus 1. This is going to be the upper limit or uh, sigma square. And when you do the same thing for this left-hand side, you are going to obtain the lower limit. So here is the interesting thing. Sigma square will be lower than this value, but the upper limit will contain the, uh, will be comprised of the sigma square value on the left-hand side. This one. So we are going to be using this value here to compute the upper bound of sigma square, whereas we are going to be using this value here to compute the lower bound of sigma square. And this is only due to arithmetics because this is in the uh, denominator, we have to do that. You have to be careful about it. If you solve a couple of questions, I think it's going to be. I'm going to solve a question from your textbook. It is about a detergent filling process. Let's say that we again are factory, and this is how I show a factory and we have detergents filled in bottles and we have actually a detergent filling machine and it fills these and as you fill them like those then you sell these products and these bottles come one by one here all right so this is what we have so and note that the height of these detergents call it h or let's call it x will be our random variable now, with respect to all the detergents, the, the whole population of the uh, heights of the liquid heights in these bottles, they are going to be, we are going to assume that they are normally distributed. So that's normal detergent. So what we would like to do is to estimate the variance of these detergent heights. Why do we want to, uh, why are, why are we interested in something like this? Uh, maybe the question may begin with this question, because up to this point, we were always interested in population mu value, which would be, if this is a detergent bottle, that would be the height, average height here, let's call it x. So we would be interested in average height. But actually, when it comes to quality, quality control or process uh, monitoring in these issues, it is also important to have an idea about the process variance. What do I mean by that? Well, in a supermarket, let's say that you have all these detergent bottles like those. Of course, they shouldn't be, they should look better compared to those that I show. Of course, one thing that is important is if it says one liter, for instance, the expected value here should be also one liter. Of course, it's not height, but I'm talking about volume here, but I think that's okay. But another point is the expected value of one liter may be satisfied with those kind of bottles. One filled to the very top 
and it is more than, let's say, this one is 1.2 liters, and another one is, say, X2 is equal to 0.8 liters. You may have a population such as this one, right, which gives an expected value of, mu of one liter, but a high sigma square value. And here sigma square will mean the deviation of height or volume from bottle to bottle. And note that when we manufacture a product, we would like this deviation, which is going to be represented by population variance, as small as it can be. Actually, small deviation between different products of a specified mu value, the specified mu value is, is going to be uh, um, an indication of a high quality product. Therefore, for this reason, we are interested not only in population mean, but we are also interested in population variance for our uh, engineering processes, whether they are related to chemical uh, products or uh, other type of products. It is a typical case for quality control. Anyway, so the question says that, or what the, how does the question proceed? We take a sample of random sample of 20 bottles, right? And of course, in an exam question, it's going to, be going to be given to you these liquid heights of 20 bottles will be given to you. But here, for the sake of um, um, bypassing those long calculations, I just omit these parts. And actually, using these X1 or R sample, we are going to find the sample variance. And here it's been already found. Please check. Uh, this result with that in your textbook is going to be 15.3 uh, milliliters squared. Therefore, this is not height, but volume of the detergent, of the liquid detergent inside the bottle. Anyway, so the question is, and note that this is going to be a point estimate of population variance. But this is not, of course, all. We would also would like to find a 95% upper confidence bound, this time a single one-sided confidence bound, and note that interval is not used, bound is, the, the term bound is used, or population variance is required. And, and what may be the practical consequence of this uh, B? It may be that once you find this upper confidence bound, okay, you are going to say that with 95% probability, which seems to be a uh, pretty high probability, your variance is lower than this value. So if this is an acceptable high uh, upper limit, then you may continue with your production or manufacturing. If this is a high value, then you may say that, okay, that much variance shouldn't be tolerable. So uh, I should just go over my production, uh, my, my equipment, uh, my setup over all again and to uh, find ways of decreasing that variance. So that's basically the question at hand. So, all right, what we are going to do is simply we are going to find we are going to be basically using this equation just to show you. We are going. Uh, we need an upper limit here, so we are going to be using this equation, the upper confidence bound. So sigma square is going to be smaller than this specific value, n minus one s square, the corresponding uh, uh, chi square value. So I'm going to be. It's written here, so I'm just going to copy here. Let's see, chi square. 1 minus alpha minus n minus 1. And this probability is going to be equal to the confidence level that's given here. So what do we have here? Let's see. Sigma square. n minus 1. How many samples, how many observations do we have? Uh, 20 bottles. So it's going to be 19 times. S square is obtained from the sample, 15.3. Note that actually we do not use explicitly here x, x bar value, but x bar value has been actually already been used in determining s square value. So to determine the s square sample variance, you have to, of course, first find the sample mean, then you find the sample variance using the sample. Mean. All right, divided by this term. Now, what is this term? It's chi square random variable of one minus lambda uh, uh, alpha. Note that now the all alpha is going to be on one side. So here, one minus alpha is equal to 0.95, our confidence level. Therefore, our significance level is going to be 0 0.05. Therefore, we are going to be interested in 0 0.05 at this. Uh, I'm sorry, one minus 0 0.05. We should be very careful about that. 
um, significance level and the degrees of freedom is 90, is going to be equal to 0.95. So we would like to find this quantity. Let's make it. It's going to be 0.95 with 90 degrees of freedom. What is this value? And in order to find this value, well, this on top of that is it's going to be a bit. So let me write this here. It's going to be 95 with 19 degrees of freedom. And let me get rid of all the writings. And this one has also uh, got away. So let me write it again. What was the value? 0.95 with 19 degrees of freedom, I guess. All right, so where is our 19 degrees of freedom? It's on this row and 0.95 is here. And 10.12. Therefore, our, oh, I have to check my notes so that I can continue with the question because all information has been erased. Sigma square is going to be smaller than 19 times 15.3 milliliters per square divided by 10.12. 12. This is going to be equal to 0.95. And when we do the computation, it's going to be probability sigma square, an upper limit of 28.7 milliliter square with a probability of 95. Therefore, we can say that sigma square is going to be smaller than, smaller equal to 28.7 milliliter square. These are variance at 95% confidence level. That would be our conclusion for the question. Now comes the last topic I would like to talk about. Now, so what is left, you may, you may say, well, we have already handled the, uh, the, the confidence intervals for population mean. We have handled confidence intervals for population variance. What about this one? Now, here in this one, population is not normal distributed, but population is Bernoulli distributed. So it's a one zero one zero phase, or yes, no, yes, no type of question here. Now, in that population, what we would like to determine is the population parameter P in that Bernoulli distributed random variable. And in order to do that, what we do is we take a sample of N observations. So again, we have a population, but this consists of 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, Bernoulli distributed. So it's going to be Bernoulli distributed parameter P. We do not know parameter P. Here we take a sample of N observations. Let's again show it with small n, right? With N observations here, they are going to be again, yes, no, yes, no, one, zero kind of outcomes. And using this sample, we would like to have both a point estimate of P and also an interval estimate of uh, p value and it's going to be these two things that we would like actually we have already talked about a maximum likelihood estimator or p if you recall just you may uh, i'm going to probably link the video related with part of the video related with that so actually p hat would be simply found as x bar so the sample mean here will be uh, uh, will be can be used as an estimator for P. For P, that's no big deal. But when it comes to this, how are we going to handle this quantity? Let's see. So here is the point. If n times P is greater than five, and n times one minus P is greater than five, then X can be approximated as a normal random variable. By the way, I think I haven't defined X. Let me define X. X is the number of successes or ones or the sum of all the observations if you take them as, if you take the domain of X as zero and one, uh, the, the possible values of X as zero and one, then, or a uh, Bernoulli distributed random variable, then uh, our, uh, or the, let's put it that way. Okay, so if the outcomes are equal to for a, a Bernoulli distributed random variable, call it xi, 0 and 1, x will be actually equal to xi from 1 to n. So hence, this x is going to be a binomial random variable. So it is the total number of successes is in n trials of a Bernoulli uh, process. 
So if you again recall, we had normal approximation for these binomial distributed random variables if these conditions were satisfied. Therefore, in this case, the binomial distributed x can be approximated as a normal distributed random variable. Of course, it's, you are going to subtract from its expected value, which is going to be n times p, and its standard deviation, which is square root of n times p minus p. Therefore, this z is going to be a standardized normal distribution. If these two conditions, as I said, are satisfied, we have a standardized normal random variable. Gate x denotes our sample mean. Uh, the, the, I'm sorry, not the sample mean, the total number of ones or uh, successes in our sample. n times n is our size of our sample. E is, going to, is the unknown population parameter value. This is also called population proportion. That's why in your textbook, this is called population proportion. That's a phrase that I do not like very much. I prefer to think about this as the population being Bernoulli distributed, and we are trying to determine the Bernoulli distributed parameter, but note that this is also equal to population proportion. All right, so what we do is, as a derivation, is very simple. We divide this uh, standardized normal distributed random variable, both for the numerator and the numerator, by n. And if you do that, actually, this part, note that this was equal to, in square root, this was n p 1 minus p. If you divide both sides by n, this is going to be in square root, it's going to be n square. Therefore, these will cancel and we are going to have an n in the denominator, like this. And there is going to be also, we were, if we had n p here, this n is cancelled and it's going to be x over n. Now, x over n is, now let's remember what this is, x is the total number of, number of successes. So we had a sample here, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, let's say, here, x will be equal to 2. And n is going to be equal to 6. Therefore, x bar. And for this case, we are going to denote it. We also show it if p is going to be equal to 2 over 6, which is going to be 1 over 3. And this was basically what was suggested by maximum likelihood estimator. Maximum likelihood estimator has shown that the Bernoulli distribution, p value, its estimate, is uh, the maximum likelihood estimate is equal to the sample mean. That's exactly what the sample mean is total number of successes over total number of trials. All right. So now this x over n is the parameter estimate. This is the parameter itself. And this is going to be the standard deviation of the parameter. Now it, in this form, please note that this very much looks like the, the z notation I have used before, x bar minus mu divided by, this was normal, standard normal distributed. That was the standard error of x bar. So the very same thing here, this x bar is our population uh, mean estimate. So here p is the population parameter, this x over n is the uh, is the estimate obtained from the sample. So in this case, this z value will lie between a minus and plus z uh, alpha over two value with a probability equal to one minus alpha. Of course, here we assume that z is normal distributed, standard normal distributed, and this is satisfied only if the p times n value and n times one minus p value is sufficiently a large number. Okay, so the rest will, the, actually the question is already over. We, we are just going to determine this value and the rest will be pretty much obvious. But there is one thing here which we should consider. Just like the case here, right, the normal distribution case, the denominator here consists of population parameter sigma. Here the denominator here, well, it is not, go, not going to be any sigma because Bernoulli distribution is actually determined only by parameter p compared to normal distribution with parameter mu and sigma square. And in this form, we assume that we had sigma square given to us. Otherwise, we would have T distribution. That's uh, where we need to uh, obtain the estimate of uh, population variance using sample variance. 
Now, Bernoulli distribution consists of only this parameter. That's why actually standard error is also written in this form. So just like here, sigma is unknown, actually the population parameter P is unknown, so it's not going to affect the, the, the equation here, but it's going to also affect the denominator here. So we are going to do something similar to what we have done when we define the t-distributed random variable. In t-distributed random variable, we have used sample standard deviation instead of population standard deviation. However, then distribution has become a little bit flatter compared to normal distribution, if you recall. There are the, the, the tails would be slightly longer. Now here, instead of p, we are going to use here in the denominator p hat which is actually this value. Now, you may say that wouldn't the, the distribution would not change, wouldn't it change? Actually, since we are dealing with naturally about, uh, we are dealing with a uh, large sample size, because n times p actually note that it should be, uh, this value should be sufficiently large so that uh, we can already apply this formulation then actually we can approximately say that this will still is going to be normal distributed. This is somewhat like this T distribution turns into a normal distribution if the sample size is above 40 case, right? So this is similar to that. So we can say that at the end, instead of this P, when we put P hat, we can obtain here this whole thing that Z is going to be equal to P hat minus P over square root p at 1 minus p at over n. This will be normal distributed, standard normal distributed. And then when you put this z here and use this lower and upper limits, then you come up with this result. Note that here actually this p corresponds to probability, the term probability concept, probability varies here p hat is the probability, uh, the estimate of the Bernoulli distributed random variable probability. So this is going to be minus some uh, uh, bound, actually, as you can see, it's the very same uh, bound that we use, uh, or very similar to what we have used in normal distribution, as z value alpha over 2 multiplied by uh, the standard error of p hat and the, the very same uh, term this time added to uh, p hat value and the resulting probability is going to be one minus alpha. Okay, here is a question about the uh, population, confidence interval for a population proportion. And I think you are going to find this question interesting because these are related with poles and you are going to realize that the rationale of constructing the poles or devising the poles is basically based on the very simple idea I'll talk about. Let's try to solve this question and see that uh, it is really the case. Well, actually we have a country here and in that country, we, we, we first of all realize that we have to convert the question in a binary answer response manner. And we would like to see in this country or estimate uh, the proportion of people in the country who support team A versus not supporting team A. So here the binary outcome would be either support team A or not team A. And this is the probability that we are interested in. So as a Bernoulli distributed random variable, you may think about supporting team A as success or fear, anything that you like, and not supporting is the, uh, uh, is the other outcome is either zero or one. Uh, anyway, so the probability of when you select a random element observation here with a probability of P, that observation will support, or that person will support team A. This is the question. And what we would like to do here is estimate P hat and also come up with an upper and lower uh, pro, uh, confidence interval for P, where P corresponds to proportion of people who support team A or probability of uh, probability selecting, uh, randomly selecting a person who supports team A. So for this purpose, what we do is we uh, conduct a poll of 1,000 people. 
So we ask this question, do you support team A or not, to 1,000 people. I think I use over case. And among these 1,000 people, 600 support team A. So if we take this as again in curly brackets as, as, as the outcome of that poll, the ones who do not support team A, let's call them zero, the results are zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, zero. It goes like this, right? 1,000 elements, 1,000 observations. And among these, we have 600 of ones and 400 of zeros. This is the case. Now, given from this sample, you may call this xi, where xi is i is from 1 to n, is a Bernoulli try. From this xi, can we estimate p, uh, p I'm sorry, uh, can we determine p hat, and can we come up with that uh, lower upper uh, confidence interval for p? That's very easy. As I said previously, p hat is going to be simply equal to x bar, maximum likelihood estimator. And this is going to be equal to, uh, we have 600 of one, 600 people say that they support the team. So X is equal to 600, right? So divided by 1000 people asked. So 0 0.6. This is the um, point estimate of population of people, uh, who, who, uh, proportion of people who support team A, or this is the uh, point estimate of Bernoulli distribu distributed distribution uh, parameter P. All right, now the next question is, can we find this lower and upper values? It's very easy. We are just going to be using this very simple uh, upper and lower limits. But in order to be able to use that, first of all, we should check whether the we are um, uh, justified in using this. So NP should be greater than 5 and N times 1 minus P should be greater than 5. Note that here it says P, the probability of success, although what we have is P hat. So we are going to use this P hat value the best that we can do. So 1000 times 0.6 is equal to 600, much greater than 5. And 1000 times 0.4 great, uh, is equal to 400, much greater than 5. Therefore, normal approximation is justified. Now, once we justify this normal uh, approximation, we are just going to directly use this approach. It consists of only a p hat term and z alpha over 2 and this term. Let's handle this. So, probability that p hat is, so it's good, the, the point estimate 0.6. Around 0.6, we are going to have a, a negative margin and the same magnitude positive margin. Minus z alpha over 2. Let's find z alpha over 2 values somewhere here. First of all, I think we need, okay, 95% confidence level. So 1 minus alpha is 0.95. Alpha over 2 is 0 0.025. So z 0 0.025, you should look up in your textbook and find that. This is equal to 1.96. So this is going to be 1.96. And then in square root, let's go back to the equation, P times 1 minus P over N. But note that here I'm going to be using again the estimated P value, 1.6, 1 minus 0.6. and square root of 1000. And then we have 0.6 here plus these terms. Now, hopefully I have already computed it in my notes. So this is going to be equal to 0 0.0304. Maybe I'm losing a little bit of too many significant digits. So I'm going to be adding here two significant figures. 0 0.0304 is going to be equal to 0 0.95. And this means probability that P is going to be between these two values is equal to 0.95. Now in newspapers, 
especially related to polls, you should have seen results such as this one. Now, this says something. With an error margin of 0 0.03, because the, 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 the point estimate is found to be equal to 0 0.6. On the other hand, 0 0.6 plus minus 0 0.03 is where the p-value is going to lie with a 95% probability or confidence level. Now, this is the result usually, maybe not in that much of a technical mirror or maybe in that much of technical mirror in newspapers, but this is exactly what this, uh, the result, uh, how the result is revealed. And let's talk about the meaning again. It means the point estimate is 0.60. On the other hand, the p the p value due to the sampling uh, variance p the true value of p could be between 0.53 to 0.63 however does that limit it cannot be lower than 0.57 or does it does that mean uh, p cannot be greater than 0.63 no this is with 95% confidence level now remember this is related with the precision of our, uh, our estimation. And if that 0 .0, 0 0.3, this error margin, if it is too large, if you would like to decrease that, we had a question related to that in the, in, 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 in the previous uh, lecture. Uh, and usually we are interested in 0 0.02, actually 0 0.2 error margin is usually what we aim. So instead of 0 0.03, if you would like to obtain a 0.2% uh, error margin, well, of course, you may say that I'm going to change this confidence level, but that's not the one that we would like. Actually, we would like the 0.2 error margin at 95% confidence level. The only way, to, the only method to do that, go back here, this margin is totally related with this part, 1.96, and we do not want to change this. You want this 95% confidence level to stay the same. You cannot, of course, change these p hat values because they are they represent the actual p, and you cannot change p value. What you can only change is n. If you take a larger sample size, then this value will be smaller. The margin is going to be smaller. Therefore, as an exercise question, for instance, I may ask you, what should n be equal to? so that you are going to have a margin of 0 0.02 for this question. And for polls, usually this value, you are going to see that it will depend, of course, on the value of p hat here, right? Because depending on this p hat value, it's going to be different values, but uh, taking a general p value, right, around uh, the typical values that, uh, p values that you may obtain from something like 0.1 to something like 0.9, the, the, the usually an n value equal to 3,000 to 5,000, and you can find the exact value here for the specific question, a value such as this one will be sufficient or required to obtain an error margin, I'm sorry, will be uh, to an error margin of 2%.